This is Art History 2, Part 2. Uh, this part, we're going to look at uh, the art of the north. That is the north of Europe. The, uh, the course is divided uh, at this, in these two centuries, so the 1300s to say 1500s, into the northern Renaissance and the, and the Italian Renaissance. Uh, they have two different distinct characteristics. And, and, and we, we just saw the beginnings of the, of the Italian. Now we're going to move to the beginnings of the art in the north. Uh, again, I want to show you uh, work from the Middle Ages to show the contrast of, of what had happened before uh, the period we're going to be talking about. In this era, um, when this was made, this is a, a, a clasp, a piece of jewelry that was found in a, uh, a dig, in, in an archaeological dig in, in England called Sutton Hoo. Uh, Hoo means hill. And it's a, it's a place where, I guess, some sort of like a Viking burial, you know, has a ship and, and all sorts of treasures associated with it. And, and they, they found uh, a lot of things that were made in the, uh, you know, the, the early centuries after, after uh, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire. But it's the kind of art that would have existed throughout, you know, many centuries uh, in, in the era before and after the Romans came to the north. Uh, it's, it's made of gold. It's jewelry. It looks like a piece of treasure. Uh, it's 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 an example of the kind of art that people make who are nomadic. That is, they don't they can't make big monumental art like like the Romans did. They have to make small portable things. And if you're going to make a small portable thing and make it special and make it you know valuable, you put a lot of work into a small space. This is a relatively small item, and it's. Uh, I think it's the kind of clasp that goes over your shoulder and holds a cloak of some sort, and it comes apart with a pin. And uh, it, what it looks like is, is, is it's made of you know, solid gold, and it's filled with all sorts of precious uh, stones and, and, and other things, you know, glass, uh, that looks very, very pretty. It does have lot, lots and lots of little, little details, little you know, bits of little work in, in, uh, in a small space. And there's, uh, abstract sort of figures over here. This is a, it's actually a boar, a wild boar, and there's two of them. Uh, that's the head of one, and this is his back, and there's his tail, little curly tail. And then this is the head of one, and its, its back goes over here. And there's lots of little, you know, filigrees and bits of, bits of gold and to, to make decorative uh, patterns and, and interlace of of objects where they, you know, one thing goes over and under and over and under, in, you know, in a tubular shapes to make things like snakes or other kind of animals with legs that intertwine in uh, what's called a, like a Celtic interlace. It's called, and then you have all this stuff with the with the checker patterns and and other pieces of glass and things that are that have been melted down and put into these these recesses. Uh, technique called cloisonné is another. Uh, similar to purse lid, all similar sort of things with animals that are inter intertwined. They're very abstract looking. Uh, but the, the point of even showing you this is that this kind of art, small, portable, precious things, a lot of work in a small space, pretty colors, decorative, flat, abstract, all those things are, are characteristics of the people of the North. And during the whole time that the Romans were uh, uh, I guess, you know, had conquered them, you know, they sort of put this art on hold until after the Romans left, and then they would return back to the, uh, the way they lived before. And this kind of art continued on in the form of the new art that they were making, uh, though in this case it would be after Christianity had, had come to the north, and, and there were monasteries around, and in each of these monasteries there were people making uh, um, books, illuminated manuscripts, and the kind of art that came out of, of those workshops, those scriptorium, uh, were the kind of things like this, where they put lots of work into a small space, and it was very pretty and decorative, and, and uh, even though you know, sometimes they would use gold as a precious material, but oftentimes it was just drawn, and, and the preciousness came from putting lots and lots of work and lots of little, lots of little details. And throughout these centuries, we're going to get to where when an increase in naturalism, like a observation of the real world, 
uh, comes to play in, in the 1300s, they're still going to do this in the sense that they will um, sort of almost obsessively look at details, look at little bitty uh, uh, things to put in pictures so as to, you know, continuing in this tradition, because this is the way they look, that's the way they think of art is, you know, something that is, that is small and has lots of work in it. So the first instance that we see in our list is this little bitty book. It's by uh, Jean Pucelle. It's a French book. Uh, made for, uh, you know, a very rich patron, I think uh, a duke, you know, has all the money in the world and, and can and pay somebody to, to spend, you know, forever amount of time on a tiny little book, you know, for his new bride. And it was, it's called a, a, book of, a Book of Hours which is something that a pious person, who's a Christian, who would have this object as a, a kind of a little book to contemplate religious themes, to use as a, a you know, a thing to, to, to it has prayers in it, and prayers are sort of said at different hours of the day. That's why it's called a book of hours. It also has calendars to tell what when feast days are or other special religious holidays are. So that uh, it's very useful, you know, practically, uh, pragmatic sort of thing to have, uh, but it, it, it's very unusual. There's very few people who would be rich, in, rich enough to own one. And this is a little one. It's like it's like three, three and a half inches tall. I mean, it's really, really small. So that um, all the pictures in it had to be drawn by somebody who's capable of rendering images at, at this small scale. So it's very precious in that sense. And, uh, you know, it's colorful and pretty and and some some artist who's extremely skillful had to spend a lot of of, of hours doing this book, and we're, we're just going to look at one open page uh, of the book where you can see two pictures. The one on the left is uh, is the kiss of Judas. We've seen two instances of already, so that um, you could compare them. You could see how Giotto did it, how Duccio did it, and now how Jean Pucelle did it, and then also you see a. Uh, uh, an Annunciation. Now we didn't see an Annunciation by uh, Duccio. Uh, we saw one by Simone de Martini, but if you look at the one by Duccio, this is what his looked like. Okay, you got you got Gabriel on the left and Mary on the right, and they're in a kind of an architectural space with this you know little rafters on the roof, and you have this little closet sort of thing with doorways, and uh, you know looking back at Jean Pucelle's, why well, there's a real close relationship between this image and Duccio's image. You know, that's kind of interesting. And also just this, this group of figures here, it's, it's similar to the Duccio thing. So there must have been some influence from the, from the Italians to the Northern artists, though you wouldn't mistake any of this stuff for Italian. It, it kind of looks Northern. Northern things are kind of spiky looking by comparison. Um, but there, it, as it happens, there were artists who were CNEs who moved up to the north and, and influenced the, the French artists in, in this sort of thing. So there's a, a direct connection. In fact, this whole period in the 1300s, I've referred to as the international style, meaning you could go anywhere in Europe and find this kind of you know, manuscript illumination. Um, so this is, this is uh, you know, some universal characteristics. And you know, one of the things about it is its preciousness, but there's also you know, the little doll-like figures. Uh, we're gonna see some some innovations in the sense that we're going to, in the north, just as in the south, we're going to move in the direction of real people. That is, uh, the uh, depiction of the, of the people in the scenes as, as being real, as being recognizable as human, and that they're you know, moving away from the, from the, the very flat patterned uh, way of rendering that you would see in the Middle Ages. Like, in just the century before, here's an instance uh, of, a, of an enunciation. And this is just as, as, as foreign as it could possibly be from what we're just looking at. I mean, these figures look like they're just cut out figures and they're as flat as they can be. They're on this ground that is, you know, has no architectural space, you know, no, no illusion of space. The architecture around them becomes a frame around them that is flat. So everything is conceived as flat shapes, even this wing is oddly sticking out here because, you know, the artist didn't want to put it in the back like you would expect if you were thinking of this as a, 
as a person in space that has a wing. You know, when you when a when a, if a person has wings, they're going to have two of them on their back, and if and if they're in profile, then one of them you'll see in the front, and one will be in the back, right here. But the artist doesn't want to do that. He sticks it over here because he's thinking of everything as flat shapes, and they doesn't want to overlap them because overlapping means means space. You know, so and 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 when he wants to frame something in architecture, he uses it as, as a surrounding frame rather than as a uh, you know back in space sort of frame. So completely different world from something like this where the angel is actually in this space. It's a bit small in scale and that has to do you know with the size of this thing. You know if this artist had had a, a big paint canvas to paint on perhaps the proportions would be more naturalistic, but in this case, he wants to be, have the figures as big as he can uh, within this small little little. This is only a couple of inches we're talking about here, and 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 he has even in this small space made his convincing convincing rendering of of the three dimensional space that these these are in, and he's thinking of them as in this space, and even even more so than this the Duccio picture I just saw, showed you, because the the angel is act inside the the space, you know. Here, Duccio is just just as sort of, you know, uh, you know he has the space back there, but the angel isn't in it. In fact, it's kind of kind of wonky how he has it related in space. But Mary looks like she's really on that throne, but the throne doesn't look like it's convincing in convincingly in the space. But he's trying. You can tell that he's 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 like he's trying to speak a language that he's not completely fluent in. You know, but he does. You know, and this looks pretty good here. You know, the things on the left sort of re lean over to the to the right there, and on the right they lean over to the left. That's the way things actually look. You know, it's not perspective the way you are going to see later, but it's but it's kind of the way things actually look to to some extent. Um, this this you know, if this is a semicircle, then this a semi semicircle seen on edge is not. You know, it doesn't look like that, but you can see they're trying. Here, this this artist has you know actually made it more successfully. Uh, you know, people in the north, even when they you know even before they had um, perspective as a uh, you know as a tool for for rendering space and measuring out space in a precise mathematical way, uh, they were still able to accurately. Observe nature and render it accordingly. You know, often you know it, as successful or nearly as successful as, as the Italians did when they when they were using perspective. Let's look at the the kiss of Judas here. Um, very similar to the to the uh, to the Duccio Maestà in the the crowd of people. You just have a couple in the front and then the crowd in the back, just indicated by a few a few tops of heads. Um, he's has fewer figures because there are it's a sm such a small uh, space and it's more abbreviated. But within the figures that he has, he's added a lots of extra detail. Like there's more helmet detail and decoration, and all the little dots on the visor of this thing, and the 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 I guess this is a lantern of some kind. It's, it's got all sorts of details in it. You know, it has a front side and a side and all these little facets and things and. Uh, he seems to be fascinated with the armor and the and the weapons and stuff. Even the crossbow here is like the the people in the north. One of their characteristics is they just love stuff. You know, they want to depict every little thing that they observe, and they just load pictures with lots of stuff. And it's one of the things that the the medieval manuscript illumination illuminators did is just filling the space with lots of things. But in their case. Often it was just abstract patterns and things, uh, and they would stick little little pictures, you know, in and out, uh, hidden, hiding in places. But uh, uh, but here, when they're depicting a scene, a three dimensional scene, or you know, close to three dimensional scene, in, in a space, you know, they want to fill it with stuff. They want to put details like they've observed, and can 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 describe every little little thing everywhere. Um, little extra stories, little ancillary stories, uh, two knights jousting on uh, riding goats and stuff, and, uh, kind of kind of 
you know, less than serious things going on. This is an image of the, of the little girl who's the princess who's going to be given this book, and there she is holding the book inside the letter D, made up of this sort of weird uh, dragon kind of character with a, with a head, and then uh, uh, someone here guarding her over here. There's a, uh, a squirrel and a monkey, and you know, just filling it, you know, there's a dog here, and there's an angel holding up the architecture. You know, there's all sorts of things. Uh, this, the words that the angels say are saying, Ave Maria, are, are there in a piece of, in a banner. I forgot to mention it before, but in the Simone Martini, it also had words written between Gabriel and, uh, and Mary, written into the gold. So this is the way a northern artist did in the international style, making these two uh, same stories that we saw the Italians making, uh, albeit this is in a very small scale. It still has many of the same features, though rendered in the way that northern artists render things, uh, with extra detail and, and a desire to make uh, things look as real as possible. Um, well, another little, little interesting feature is Christ's figure has this weird kind of sway to it. You know, his belly sticking out and he's, and he's kind of an S curve. And do you look at Mary over here, also has a kind of the same sort of a, a reciprocal thing. It's as if they're, they're, she, he's also looking out towards her. And so that these two pictures have a relationship to them. That is, um, you know, one of the things that, that people were enjoying to meditate upon were something called the, the joys of the Virgin and the sorrows of the Virgin. And, and, and you would look at the Annunciation as being a joy, as this is a happy time, and then the, you know, something, the tragic time is his arrest and eventual crucifixion. And they would, the artist on different pages would also juxtapose different stories for the same uh, contrast, the joys of the Virgin and sorrows, sorrows of the Virgin. Uh, just to give you an idea, of another artist and how they would represent this same sort of story. This is Giotto from the Arena Chapel that we were seeing before uh, in, in one of the stories with, with Mary, or actually this is actually Mary's mother and Annunciation of her birth, but it's the same sort of thing with Gabriel or, uh, announcing coming into a, a, a window in this case. And the figures, and especially this figure, are all inside an architectural space that, you know, this is this is the most convincing yet in terms of actual three-dimensional space and people in it. Uh, that was very spare and sparse compared to, you know, the northern artists, you know, who, who likes to fill it with all sorts of things and details like, like that little architectural bracket right there and then you know, a bunch of angels filling over here just filling in space just to be filling it in with all sorts of more decorative stuff. You know, that's, that's a northern thing. But in Italy, they like it more sparse, but they want the, the, the space to be more real and measured, as if the, the people could get up and walk around and be in that space. All right, let's look at a sculpture from the north. Also, it, it is, a, is a very th different thing than what we're used to. Um, this is uh, called a... Uh, Vesper built. Uh, it's also called in Italian a pietà, which is you know means pity. It's it it is a representation of Mary holding the dead body of Christ uh, after the crucifixion. It's made of wood and it's painted. It's not it's not huge and monumental. It's a, it's a small altarpiece sort of thing. But what I was just talking about in terms of the joys of the Virgin and the vir Virgin and the uh, sorrows of the Virgin, this is sort of uh, would be counterposed to a Madonna and child in throne. And so you would see that as a, as a joy, and this is the sorrow. And that one of the aspects of the North, um, especially this is a German, um, is that they go much more into uh, emotionalism and distortions for the purpose of, of eliciting an emotional response. Because if you want someone to meditate on the joys of the Virgin or the sorrows of the Virgin, then you want to really, really make one joyful and the other very sorrowful. And, you know, no amount of exaggeration is, is too extreme for that because you really, really want to, you know, if you're, if you're contemplating the, the sorrows, you really want to see and feel the, the pain and the suffering of Christ. And, and to do that, 
the artist here has exaggerated the emaciated body. The, the wounds are huge in relationship to the figure. They have these big floret kind of clusters of, of, uh, of blood spatters or like, you know, blood pouring out of them in these, in these kind of uh, stylized manner. Um, blood seems to be part of the painting of the whole surface of the figure, like streams of blood, and the you know distortion of the body, the head hanging by, down dead, the the crown of thorns, the the closed eyes, you know everything about it is to is to be gruesome and ugly and give you this this emotional response, so that when you when you contemplate the that aspect of the the Christian story, you you feel it much more. So that. That is a characteristic of of the North that, that they they prefer it that way in their art. They want their art to be more emotional, and um, um, and they don't mind exaggerating for for that effect. Uh, here, let's. But you know, this this is in the in the thirteen hundreds. But in in the fourteen hundreds, you know, in the North, we get something like this, which is much more different. And this is this is. Uh, much more in terms of a, uh, the prog progression that we're going to see in both the North and the South, where you go from something in the early days as being primitive, that is far removed from the way the real world looks, or naturalism, to something that's much more close, closer to, uh, uh, to the way the real world, world, real world looks, to idealism, to, uh, you know, almost a super degree of, of, of naturalism. This is called The Well of Moses by Klaus Sluter. This is a, one, one that's on your list, and even though it has several figures sort of around this, this, uh, this sort of tower here, this is part of a fountain. There would be water in the past. There was water here. It was a fountain, and there would be, you know, more elaborate things going on uh, up here, and there's, right now it's inside this building, and it was it's part of a monastery. And uh, you know, paid for by a rich patron who wanted to, you know, be buried in this monastery and, and have lots of, lots of nice things. So it, it's it's called the Well of Moses because Moses is the prominent figure. But there's other prophets. Uh, there's King David. There's Jeremiah. I think uh, Zechariah is on on the back here. You can look around the back and see some other figures. It's it's made of stone, I believe, and it's but it's it's been painted and. It's kind of odd to see painted sculpture, but uh, that was one of those things they would do in the north. They, in fact, the sculpture in the past had been painted uh, in, in the Roman times and in the Greek times. They had painted sculpture, but the paint's all been worn off. And, and by the time the people in the Renaissance saw those things, they thought that they were always without paint. And so when they started making sculpture, they didn't put paint on them. And so in the West, at least, the tradition became that sculpture was the color of the material, whether it's be wood or stone or or bronze or whatever. It's 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 it usually left without any color at all, uh, and that became the tradition until much much later when people realized, hey, archaeologists would look at old sculpture and say, hey, it used to have used to have paint, um, but here in the north, the tradition was alive of painting, though it's kind of kind of uh, kind of faded. But look at these people. These look like real people. They look like the artist has gone to trouble to make them look like individuals, uh, particular people. They have specific characteristics. You know, the size of his nose, the the wrinkles on his brow, and the the kind of beard that he's wearing, and the the particular attributes of of things that that he's holding. Things like the scroll here, the the, the characteristics of his um, you know his accoutrements here. Uh, this is <clears throat> Moses that we saw from the front here on the side. Look at all this drapery. Lots and lots of bunched up drapery and stuff. They really, really like the surfaces of things. They really can't get enough of making the surface as interesting and patterned and um, as real as possible, even to the exclusion of the what's underneath, like, you know, you can't see the figure underneath. It's all all the body under there, the skeleton, the muscles, just exactly how the legs are oriented. You can't see them because they're covered with drapery, and it's really the thing on the surface that, that the artist is more concerned with, and that that has always been a, 
a characteristic of northern artists is that they they emphasize the surfaces of things and that contrasts with the Italians who are more interested in the structure of things especially the internal structure and it didn't didn't really lend itself so much in the first instances we saw with with Giotto and and uh, Duccio and Simone Martini because they're they're not really they haven't really got to that point but later in the Renaissance we're going to see how artists in the, in the Italian Renaissance were much more interested in you seeing the measured space figures where you can tell exactly what the figure is doing under even when they're wearing wearing um, drapery or clothes or something you can tell what the figure is doing because they want you to see the underlying structure opposite case for the for the northern artists they want you to see um, the surface and they put all their attention in surface detail and really really wonderfully elaborate cascading drapery and doing drapery doing all sorts of wonderful stuff and if you see the body at all it just sort of sticks out a little bit here and there uh, just for effect and when they want to show the face well that's that face isn't that great let's see do I have a better one yeah here's a closer up image this is Moses I mean they, it, it's unbelievable the amount of detail that's in this face uh, and to make it look like a real person you know they really want you to see these these figures as if they were you know your grandfather or somebody somebody that you know somebody you you could see existing now uh, horns why does he have horns well that's weird but it's one of those things where it was a mistranslation by something from the Saint Jerome when he was originally translating the Bible from Hebrew into into Latin he, he mistranslated the word for rays of light that would come from Moses when he came down from the mountain he said it had rays of light emanating from his head, and, and, he, and he used the word for horn instead. And that caused uh, images of Moses to be his attribute, his horns. I don't know why what they thought about that, but at some point, I think during the Charlemagne era, they fixed the error. And, and, uh, uh, but from then on, even though the error was fixed, they, under, they understood, that, oh, it's not, it's not horns, it's rays of light. They still um, uh, persisted even in something like this, and even as late as when Michelangelo did an image of, uh, of Moses in the, in the 1500s, he still, he used horns on, on that too, because that's just, everybody just understood, he's got horns, that's how you recognize it to be Moses. Uh, here's a couple of other things from the same artist, um, and also in this same monastery, he, he also made these images of, of monks who were mourning the dead, the, the man who was the patron, was dead and buried into this place, and he wanted around his uh, sarcophagus to have all these little mourners, so that forever mourners would be um, um, lamenting his death. And look at these figures. They're just wonderful, expressive little figures, uh, but they're made in such a way that the, the figure themselves are mostly hidden, like especially this one and this one. You only see a hand. Here you don't see any hand at all, and the face is just sort of hidden in this, in this hood. Uh, here you see, you do see a head, but mostly, it's the expression is in the drapery, and and by drapery uses the abstract quality of all this stuff, is is doing all the talking, rather than a human being doing the talking, and and that is just just incredible what they can do, with. You know, with 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 stone, and and carving, and 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 using as an expressive thing, drapery. So let's look at it the next. Next, uh, this is this is also part of the international style. This is a, a manuscript illustration or illumination. Uh, uh, along the same line as that Jean Pucelle thing, but it's a little later. It's in the four, early fourteen hundreds. It's by a, a group of artists called the Limburg Brothers. I think there were three of them, but no, you don't need to uh, remember their names. Just, just to, they're, they're the Limburg Brothers, and it's a, a also a, a kind of like a book of hours, the same sort of book but bigger, and with more elaborate pictures, much more colorful, lots of lots of paintings in it, and full page uh, illustrations uh, for the calendar pages. Uh, this would have had the same sort of things, though a more deluxe version than the, than the little bitty book. Uh, 
before uh, the Jean Pucel Book of Hours was, you know, its its main feature was the fact it was small and miniaturized, and so that made it precious in that sense. But if you're going to have a bigger book, something along the size of, say, um, I don't know, 14 inches tall or something, however tall this is, then the preciousness is going to be in putting a huge amount of detail in these pictures. Every one of the calendar pages, I mean, there's 12 of them, one for each month, has a, a an accompanying accompanying uh, illustration, and this is what February looks like. Um, January, here's an example. This is what January looks like, you know. And here's uh, and they 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 represent the seasons. Here's one where uh, where you can see the the planting season, I guess, in the spring sometime, and and so and it also represents the the dukes who Duke de Berry is the name of the patron here, and the, the name of the book is called The Very Rich Hours of the Duke de Berry. And uh, this is one of his castles, so one of, the, one of the reasons to make this is to show off his, his money in, the, in, in, in paying somebody to paint these, but also to show off that he, you know, he's got pictures of his castles, and this is the way he lives. And the, the, the work, though, that we're going to look at is our representative sample is this February page, because it's filled with all sorts of innovations. If we look real quick at the calendar, it's got the, the names of the months, I, I guess that's February there, and the days, and I guess there's an indication of what the moon is going to be like and stuff, uh, the zodiac symbols and what the astrological stuff is going to be, and so it's got information uh, represented up there. But down here, it's showing you what February looks like for the world that the peasants live in. Now remember this wasn't made for the peasants, it was made for the rich people, and their attitude towards the peasants was sort of like the, the people in their charge were more like their pets. So it's very quaint. That is, it's looking at them uh, with, a, with an idea of the sort of an ideal world that they live in, almost the way of a per person would make a a train set with a miniature town in it, and 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 marvel at all the little figures and stuff, and all the buildings and and people uh, representing the, their daily life. It's it has that sort of feel to it of of preciousness. So what we see here um, is an artist who has represented for his rich patron what the world the peasants live in looks like, at least filtered through in such a way as to make it look pretty and decorative and, and uh, but, but as real as possible. The sky is leaden, you know, it looks like a winter sky. You know, he has this blue that's really, really bright, but he doesn't use that for the sky because in the winter, this is the way the sky looks, and they have chimneys with smoke coming out of it, and he's rendering the smoke. Uh, the people cut down trees to, to burn in their, in their chimney, so here's a guy with an axe cutting down a tree. Uh, here's somebody driving a donkey to town. There's the town in the distance, uh, and then well, I guess they have a load of stuff they're going to take over there. They have beehives. They have a kind of a grain silo. Uh, here's a here's a woman who's wrapped up in a shawl, sort of behaving the way you do when you when you've gone out into the cold, and she's you know huddled for that purpose, and she has. Her breath, the frost of her breath is indicated. You know, that's the sort of thing that you can imagine the, the, the king or the duke, you know, looking at this and just, said, oh, just being, being very impressed, you know, that, at, at, the, at the detail, the level of detail that is the first instance that I know of, of, of a representation of the frost. In fact, come to think of it, it's the only instance I've seen in a painting where someone has painted the frost coming out of somebody's breath. Uh, you know, it's just, it just never happens. And, but, but as far as observing the real world, you know, he gets full marks for, for that. But also for all these other things. There's this little uh, pen or the paddock that, that, that the, uh, the sheep are in. The sheep look like little toy sheep, but they, you, know, you see the texture of their wool. You see the relationship between white and black sheep, which is about the right number, I suppose, of, of how many blacks you have to whites. And the wicker... Um, I guess it's called wattle. This kind of fencing that they use 
uh, it's kind of a wicker version of fencing. You know, we have grain on the ground. It attracts birds who come eat the grain. And, you know, that's, that would be a, a quaint thing to look at and put in a picture, make it pretty, but also almost like a, like a silent scientific illustration of the way the world looks. Uh, and this is a neat little feature of showing a, a building with a, a wall removed so we can see the inside. Inside, you have three people. There's a, the lady of the house wearing a bright decorative uh, blue gown, holding up her, her skirt so that the fire, the heat from the fire, can warm her. Um, she has two servants back here, a man and a woman. You can see that they have their uh, uh, their skirts sort of lifted so that so that you can see them their nakedness underneath, and that would be something that I could picture the uh, uh, you know the duke and his and his retinue sort of laughing at the at the peasants for that. You know, it's you know they would never show themselves with with that kind of uh, indecorousness. But the, the artist has gone to trouble to render as many objects as he can so as to, 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 to show you the reality of the world. You know, the, the, the hanging rod with cloth on it. So, you know, they're, perhaps they got wet when they were out in the snow and it's being dried. Uh, there's a bed over in the background with a bedspread. And the bedspread has a, uh, a pattern on it that, that looks like it's diminishing in space. So it looks like it's filling in this space, just like the... Uh, lines on the roof do uh, that it's that it's indicating a, a, a very sophisticated knowledge of the way things look like in space done by somebody who's observed very closely the world and you can tell just by this frost in the thing that this guy is an observer of the world you know even the little cat uh, you know by the fire and he, he understands how people are how they how they behave how they um, you know, how they make things and arrange their world, you know, albeit in a, a toy-like version of it. Um, but everything in this is, is looks like a sophisticated innovation compared to uh, the previous instance of that Jean Pucelle book, uh, where it's much more colorful, m more rendering of surface details, and, and more stuff. The, uh, the January page, you know, has a different take because, you know, I think these pages alternate between images of the peasant world and images of the, the nobility. And when you have the nobility, they are rendered more, more medieval, I guess you could say. They look like cutouts, more so. And they, they live in, a, in this world of, of, of tapestries and, and bright colors and silks and, and, you know, brass or gold. Um, um, pots and pans and stuff, and, and they feast all the time, and they have tapestries on the walls with um, battles that they've been in, and the, here's the duke here sitting in front of the fireplace. It's acting kind of like a halo for him, and he's got this elaborate robe on with, you know, lots of detail and brocade or whatever. Uh, dogs eating on the table, and lots of pheasants or grouse or whatever, whatever they're eating. And everybody is elaborately dressed in, in colorful and, you know, exotic costumes. All of these things are observed in nature, but they're also sort of removed into the world of the, what the nobility wants to project. That is, that they, they live in a world of pomp and circumstance. On another page, where there's, you know, more about the real world or closer to the real world, we have the first indication of, you know, cast shadows on the ground. You know, the, the artist has observed that in the real world you have shadows. And that, that's something that a, a medieval artist, you would you could never imagine them thinking in terms of objects casting shadows on the ground because that implies the real world and it implies space. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's just a, a different way of thinking. But not only that, if you look, at, look closely... Back here, even you know, in the distance, first of all, things that are distant are very small because that's a characteristic of, of optics is that things seem to get smaller in the distance. But also look at the, there's a river back there and there's canoes and the reflections of the canoes in the water, uh, the reflections of people in the water. So uh, this guy or these guys who are painting this, the, the Limbo brothers, 
really have a handle on, on how the real world looks. And it just seems you know, streets ahead of anything that came before. And it, it all comes from this conception of the world, of the, 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 the work of art being representing the way things actually look, you know, naturalism. Let's take another step forward to another artist named Robert Kempen. This is the Marode altarpiece, named after one of the um, owners of it. Uh, but its 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 actual title, I guess, would be the Annunciation, because it has an Annunciation like we've seen before. Except in this case, it's taking place in a real living room of a contemporary person, like from 1420s or whenever this was made. Uh, this is what the architecture looked like inside of a kind of a you know a well-to-do businessman, say, or merchant who would uh, have all these things in his home. And he's out here in the wing. This is, you see these little hinges. This would have closed like a box. These two wings would, would close over this front thing. It's only about, say, two feet tall. And it's oil paint on a, on a panel. But this is the patron here, uh, kneeling and having kind of a vision as if uh, the, the, you know, Mary and Gabriel and the scene that, that he knows from, from meditating on it is actually happening in his house. There's Joseph over on this side uh, as a carpenter in his shop. We'll look at that in a second. But just look at how this artist represents this room. What we saw beginning with the, the room that this Annunciation occurred in, the, uh, the Jean Pucelle little teeny illustration, uh, continues on in, in you know, a very steep upward uh, graph of, of degree in comparison, where you see it, it, it also has these, these little rafters in the ceiling, say, but they're much more convincing in terms of their arrangement. This, this, looks, look, this looks almost like proper perspective here. And even down to the little details, like the little cracks, the, the wood grain of the wood, even this little little mark right here, which indicates that, you know, this is when they when they smooth out the wood with a with a tool, kind of adds, and it creates this little this little bevel right there. And you know, he's observed every single um, instance of of the way things are made. He's understood everything that is made and how it lines up. The, the nails that hold the thing together and the different pieces of wood that make up the rafters that, and joists that are in the ceiling. And this just goes on and on. Uh, the, the candle holders that are here, the, the shutters on the window, the kind of shutters that um, have hinges on them and you have a lattice here and you can, you can open it up and have complete light and air or you can close the lattice and have you know, block out some of the light, but still have the air, or you can block out everything uh, if you close them all. But even down to the little details, like, you know, the, it, the nails have have streaks of rust from, you know, when they rusted in it and the water ran down and it created these little streaks. You know, the, the, the artist has just observed everything. This is a candle uh, where the flame has just gone out, and this is the way the smoke looks. Uh, I guess this is comparable to you know that the smoke coming out of that person's breath in the in the Limburg brothers, but this is this is a, this is you know, uh, you know exponentially a greater degree of of uh, realism that we saw than we saw there. Brass looks like brass. The light that shines on this metallic object, you can tell that it's metal compared to cloth, say, because metal has a shiny bit. You know, it has light and dark, and, and light plays over the surface in a certain way that tells you what the material is, the, the color and the shininess. The, uh, all this tells you, and, and the artist has observed that. He's also observed how light casts a shadow on the, on the background. Not just any light, but multiple lights. When you have light coming from different windows, each one is going to have its own shadow. And so... If you look at every object, like the cloth here, is casting multiple shadows on surfaces everywhere. There's multiple shadows, depending on the angle of the light and the and the strength of that light. And now, you know, one light, oh, super, one shadow superimposes onto another in different degrees of, of tonality. Look how, how complex this thing is, and and the person has really observed not just you know how light 
creates these different levels of, of, of shadows, but also like, you know, these shadows are cast against this corner so that it has to bend around the corner at different angles. So, you know, we're dealing with a, a world of sophistication of depicting the real world and observation that's even greater. It's as if the, the this person saw that Limburg brother work and decided, you know, I can do better than that. I can, I can, I can, I can beat that. It was like a competition. Everywhere you look is a different surface material, and the surface material has been rendered meticulously. The wood on the floor here, and all the little tiles that makes up the wood, the, the the aging of it. You know, you can tell that it's it's a, not a brand new floor. It's got it's got wood grain in it, and it's got you know marks and stuff by furniture moving. Look at the grain in this wood. Look at the the way the the play of of all this cloth that the the virgin is wearing this this red robe. With the way the way the cloth moves around her knees, say, and the little gold hem that uh, goes around how the you know, in certain places where it's convex, it, it pokes out and light reflects off of it, creating this little sparkly effect. The angel has a uh, some sort of tie around the waist, and, and it has jewels on it, little rubies and stuff, and other other little accoutrements that uh, probably are ecclesiastical, like a something that a that a priest might wear. Uh, But there's another thing going on in addition to observing the way the real world looks, is that this is this is a supernatural event. It's Mary and, and and Gabriel. Something that is occurring like a vision of of that event that occurred in in the Bible, but it's it's now occurring in somebody's home. And in that home is filled with objects, and those objects all have like a double meaning. One is that it's an actual object in that room, the kind of object that would be candlesticks, brass vessels, uh, glass windows. All these things are things that, that would be in this, in this uh, room anyway, but because it's an enunciation, they all have double meanings, like, for example, the, the lilies. We saw lilies in the, um, in the Simone Martini thing, and I, if you want to go back and look at that, each one of those lilies was, was rendered very meticulously with, with you know, every direction of, of lily that was that you could think of for that one is so in a small space in that Italian picture it does have a little bit of this but this is the whole painting is like that uh, but the fact that it's lilies is is it re really lilies represent uh, the Mary and, and you know the the Virgin Mary and that's it's one of her attributes and the fact that it's it does double duty as being an attribute of her but it's also the sort of thing that would be in, in this home anyway. The same with this brass vessel. There's probably some other reason for a brass vessel. You know, you wash your hands and you dry them on this cloth, which looks suspiciously like uh, a, a Hebrew or, you know, a Jewish um, prayer cloth. And, you know, other things in here, if you start seeing, you know, have extra meanings. So this, is, this, this bench that he's wearing, it look, that she's leaning against, looks like a pew. Why is one candle snuffed out? Does that have a meaning? It probably does. Why does why is there a candle here and not one here? That probably has a meaning as well. In fact, everything in here probably has some double meaning that, that references the story being told. This little figure of a baby holding a cross coming in with these light uh, rays, this is the Holy Spirit, you know, impregnating Mary at the words you know, that the, that, the, that the angel speaks. But instead of making it just the, the, you know, the Holy Spirit indicated by lines, it actually has a physical looking baby. You know, it's because this is a world, an artist who's representing everything as if it were a real world thing, rather than just a spiritual thing or a symbolic thing. So look over at, uh, at Joseph. Carpenter over here at work. Does he have some stuff? Oh, it's, everything is incredible. The degree of realism here, the, the, the nails and the, uh, um, the streaks of rust, you know, the landscape in the background, the cityscape in the background and their distance and the, and the people walking around, their, their shadows, their, uh, all the details of architecture, 
you know, it's just unbelievable. You could just you could just look for hours and hours all at all this stuff. He's in a little room that's attached to his house, and he has a window out with a ledge that he can put something out there to sell. And this is something that people in this city, you know, Flanders, I believe it is, that that um, that has a you know, that's one of their features is they would, you know, if you had a house in town, you could sell stuff out the window. You could make have a little cottage industry. And he's a carpenter, so he's making stuff. And what is he making? Uh, mousetraps. Mousetraps. Why mousetraps? That's something a carpenter might make. It's made of wood. Uh, he has a couple of different designs there. Uh, I've heard an explanation that there's there was some sort of, uh, like a, a sermon by a priest or, or a preacher who who used mousetraps as an analogy of, you know, Christ catching the devil, something like that. But it may have some sort of meaning as well. But the artist has, just as in the living room, has looked at everything that a person might uh, uh, recognize as being in a, a carpenter shop. You know, all the tools are observed in all their materials and how they look and the way they would be sitting on the table and the nails, even the sha wood shavings. Uh, the drill. Uh, what's he What's he making here? He's got, he's he's got a piece of wood where he's drilling holes, and he's um, uh, there's marks where 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 he's going to drill other holes. And look at the he's holding the tool in such a way. He, you, this is the way you apply a drill. You first sort of push push it against the the mark, and then you pull it position it vertically and start turning it. You have to hold, have one hand holding the knob here, and then you turn the other thing. Uh, to, to drill holes with. I think it's called a spoon bit there. Um, everything. is just it's, You just go on and on and on. Even though the mark on the piece of metal to indicate that, you know, that the person who made this has put a little harm hallmark to indicate who made it. Wooden shoes. So look over at the patron. He's kneeling down here in his garden. And all of the little plants are observed. Every one is... is I'm sure is botanically accurate. You know, he's gone out and, and you know, this is the way this plant looks. This is the way this plant looks. And he wants to show you all of the stuff. The, the door, the hinges, the, the lock and the key. I bet the key has some sort of meaning that's related to the Annunciation. Uh, he's got, he has a dagger with a handle. It's a fancy one. There's a purse with a lid and other stuff. His wife is back there who has rosary beads. And he's he's got a particular kind of headdress that uh, that would be popular at the time, uh, and the artist has observed every little fold of that cloth to show you the reality of it, even the little pins to hold it in place. Uh, there's a mysterious man back there. He I've heard him it, it described as the the painter. That is the artist is representing himself in this space, or maybe it's something else that has some meaning that uh, you know we don't know. Um, there's a, you know, magpie up here probably means something. Other identifiable birds, bricks, every brick is painted, the rose in the garden. The fact that it's a garden itself is also, I believe, a, an enclosed garden is an is a, a attribute of Mary. Uh, everything you can imagine is in this picture. Uh, and it's just, it's such a, a, a clearly convincing world. Um, that we that we believe everything in it, and 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 you, you can't can't conceive of how it could have been made at the time that it was made. Because it's not that many years after that, um, the 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 calendar pages and that Limburg brother things we saw, and that wasn't that many years after the 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 uh, uh, Jean Pucelle book. So in a very short time, they went from very primitive. Or relatively primitive, to something that is just, you know, practically in the world of, of photographs and cameras that we're we're familiar with. But there's also something very wonky about everything. The if you look at the at the space that it's in, it's not a measured space. This is not made by somebody who knows perspective. There's no measuring of how far a thing goes back in space. The the floor seems to be tilting up so that we could look down more down at the floor. And it's the same with the table. The artist wants you to see the stuff on the table, so he tilts the table up. He's not particularly concerned that everything be seen from exactly the same point of view. Now, the things, you know, your point of view is sort of in the middle, so things on the right sort of 
lean towards the left. Things on the left lean towards the right. So it, you know, that works. But there's something really wonky about the whole spatial relationship of everything, and that's a that's just a, a characteristic of northern artists too. Even when they get closer and closer and closer to the real world, they're still not the same measured space. Like when you start using perspective, uh, which is going to be invented in, in Florence about the time that this was painting, painted, and artists start using, using real perspective uh, in measuring the space, they can make images that are, you know, as accurate, at least positional, position wise, as a photographic camera can do. And, and you know, that's, that's, that's streets ahead of this. But these artists are so adept at looking at the real world that you believe the space, even when it's not measured. The next artist, who's going to be, you know, he has things that are, you know, the next degree up uh, from what we just saw is, is Jan Van Eyck. Jan is spelled J-A-N. And he is uh, uh, also, you know, from the Low Countries, from the area just north of, of France and to the west of Germany. It's, uh, it's going to become Holland and, and Flanders and uh, uh, Belgium and Luxembourg, all the, that area around in there is where he's from. Uh, Jan van Eyck has, uh, has this painting of a man with a red turban. Uh, most probably it's a, it's a self-portrait. Though it may it may not be, it's, it looks very much like a self portrait. And uh, when I talk about how the northern artists are really, really interested in the surfaces of things and 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 grasping the world really as it is, uh, this is this is this is an extreme version of that sort of thing. Even though it's not filled with all the stuff that the last picture was, it's just the portrait, and most of the portrait is is just dark, and you don't really see much, but in this face, you feel that this person has really observed the face and wanted to show the face exactly as it is, not idealizing anything, you know, showing every little wrinkle, every, all the puffiness of the eyes. You can see his age. You know, you can see the little, uh, all the whiskers. He hasn't been a couple of days since he's shaved. And so you see some whiskers, and some of the whiskers are, are, are white, so he's, you know, he's, you know, he's more middle-aged. Uh, and you know he's he's got some some sagginess and some you know imperfections in his face, even this little uh, you know the, the yellowness of his eyes and the bloodshot eyes and the fact that it, it, it doesn't look it doesn't look pretty, you know it's made to look as though the artist wants to tell the truth. He wants to look at something and show you exactly what he sees, and that is something that is you know far removed from. From the world that that we've been we've been in up to now, and so uh, in the next in the next video we'll be looking at um, the wedding portrait that was called the Arnolfini portrait uh, by Jan Van Eyck, and we'll see how how that goes in the next one.